Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. So we're doing a special series of podcasts which I'm recording over Google Hangouts. So we're doing audio and video because for some unknown reason, people don't wanna come see me face to face right now. But there's always opportunity and the cool thing is I'm able to now podcast with people from all over the world. So we're gonna get an amazing eclectic mix of people from, from different industries, different perspectives to share their story and tell us you know, their thoughts and feelings on what's going on right now and all of that cool stuff hope you enjoy it please subscribe in all the usual places and enjoy great and we're live um really really great to be joined by wolfgang uh Lehmacher. uh thank you so much for joining me and for those that don't know wolfgang wolfgang is an expert in global supply chain and he is kindly agreed to come and, and give me a, a good lesson on what's been going on in the world um, from COVID and everything supply chain. So Wolfgang, thank you so much and, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Lewis. Great to be here. And you. So so just, just tell everyone, so where are you uh, where are you based at the moment? I'm, uh, I'm in Hong Kong at this point and uh, I think it's a good place to be. We didn't have a true full uh, lockdown there okay. were 1,200 people infected in Hong Kong and six deaths so far, and uh, life has been going on. Great, great. And and how's it how's it at the moment? So cases have have completely died down, stopped. So what's the the scenario? As far as I know, I'm not even closely following it, but uh, there haven't been new cases for a while. There are people coming in so there are flights arriving and from time to time you have cases yeah. and uh, I believe Hong Kong is uh, dealing well with this uh, the people are very self-disciplined everybody wears masks there is a sanitizing uh, opportunity all across the city uh, restaurants and banks do temperature checks so yeah. it's quite a, a relatively smooth uh, situation. Great. It felt it's 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 felt like um, Hong Kong and, and and Asia more generally has dealt with it a lot better than than Europe. I'm in I'm in London and culturally here we don't wear masks, so it's it's been it feels like it's been a bit of a struggle to get people to to wear them and and now you have to wear them on public transport. That's the the, the key thing. Um, and the, the track and trace apps haven't taken off here either. No one wants to be traced here. Um, and again, I think uh, the, the kind of the cultural differences have, have meant maybe that Asia's dealt with it much better. Um, it's been interesting. Yeah, it should work in the UK. The, the Asians see uh, the wearing of masks as a, a way of protect the others, but also as a gesture of politeness. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So how have you seen just kind of on, on the on the supply on the global supply chain? Um, I think on the face of it, certainly to start with, people thought you know there'd be major supply issues and 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 here in London, uh, you you walked around the uh, the supermarkets just as the lockdown happened and you know there was no toilet paper. Everyone was 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 panic buying and you know there was a period here of of maybe a month where people were just going crazy. Um, what what's What's it, what's it actually been like? What is the, the, the kind of, I guess, the, the, the current state of the global supply chain? Despite all the uh, hurdles put in the way of uh, supply chain professionals, I think they manage the situation very well. It is very hard to deal with uh, peaks. And uh, we see peaks in the area of uh, personal protection equipment. We see peaks caused by uh, panic buying, as you mentioned it. We saw sudden border closings and controls that uh, caused uh, mile long traffic jams. And uh, that causes uh, a risk for supply. But in general, uh, supply chains are pretty robust. Uh, supply chain professionals are problem solvers. And even without technology, they are able to keep uh, things going for a while, although with technology, it's much easier. Yeah. But at that point, the concerns are much less on the supply side. They are on the demand side of things. Right. And 
it started all as a parallel, as a simultaneous supply and demand shock. Let's remember that um, early on in the crisis, uh, Microsoft warned that their supply could be uh, affected because they are um, putting software in China on their computers. And, uh, but at the same time, Starbucks warned that they had to close 50% uh, of their stores in uh, China. So from the beginning, it was uh, demand and supply which had been affected. We have also to know that uh, it fell into the uh, Chinese New Year. Before Chinese New Year, usually companies start to increase their inventories and uh, build up buffer stocks. Then we have that delayed supply after the Chinese New Year. So we had a, a very nice buffer and um, that prevented that we had, um, in fact, uh, a lot of disruptions um, um, in Europe or, or the US. The, the disruption were very different. When, when the production arrived, which was not able to be canceled, uh, for example, clothes in Europe after Chinese New Year, the, the shops were closed and then the disruption uh, was uh, coming in form of uh, shortages of warehouse uh, space to uh, store all the goods could not be sold. Uh, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's funny, when, I, when we got locked down, you kind of you took a step back and you looked at it and I had you know food delivery um, delivered to my door and we have Ocado here, Tesco, Sainsbury's, they, they were delivering. Uh, the, the slots were, took a bit of time to, to get sometimes, but even like the local supermarkets and all the shops were fully stocked. I ordered a new computer during lockdown because my old one broke, which was really bad timing. And it came from China and it came to me within a week and, and, they, and it tracked, it said from, this, from the, the factory, to Hong Kong, to Southern England, on the uh, uh, on the uh, on the uh, the lorry, to my house, and I thought that that was amazing. You know, in the peak of peak of the pandemic, my computer made it within a week uh, to my house, which which I thought was great. So I think the reality for me was very different to what I was reading in the papers and 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 all of the the, the panic that was uh, that was made up. Yeah. I can only agree that I had the same impression that there was a, a lot of hype and also a lot of uh, unjustified anxiety. Um, although we have also to admit that uh, this is a moment of human tragedy and uh, it is uh, emotionally uh, difficult to, uh, to go through. So um, it's natural that fears build up, but I, uh, believe that um, supply is secured, and um, <clears throat> what uh, what is good to hear uh, about the computer is that 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 also worked because, uh, for example, the commercial flight cancellations have taken forty percent of capacity out of the air cargo market, and to get the computer from China to to the UK, you need air freight. So, but still, in those days. Uh, uh, the uh, transport was uh, was um, conducted without problem. Yeah, no, no, it was great. So, what's the state now? Then uh, is it is it really back to normal now? I think it's not back to normal, um, and I'm saying this because my view is that the supply chain is the economy, and the economy is a supply chain, and we know that the economy is suffering. We know that uh, a lot of uh, uh, sectors uh, struggle on the demand side when we think about automotive and clothes and, uh, and furniture, et cetera. Uh, although also on the other side, there are sectors which are booming like medical equipment and grocery stores, uh, online delivery services. Uh, so we are living in a, in a uh, time which uh, has a lot of animal, uh, unusual, let's say unusual uh, uh, effects or suffering from unusual effects. Uh, what has in fact started uh, in China with a, a lockdown um, 
moved on to a, in fact, failed containment and a ripple effect. And where we are now, I see this then the third phase, uh, we have this hesitant reopening, the concerns about a, a second wave, and uh, that makes it very hard. And the biggest challenge for companies today is the uncertainty. Yeah, absolutely. I've also have you found um, the kind of that people have been an issue as well. So, so in terms of being able to staff warehouses um, to get enough staff in. Uh, the social distancing as, as, do you, have you seen that as being uh, an issue as well we have uh, clearly the uh, the need for more resources in the area where where we see peaks uh, that means that the amazons of this world had to recruit more people and uh, this is always a, an effort uh, the same with uh, delivery uh, companies um, uh, I've just spoken uh, with a company in Korea and they saw an explosion of e-commerce volumes and they right. need to be handled. Yeah. So yes, there are, there, are, there are challenges. And then we had at the very early stage of the pandemic, also the situation that people didn't want to go to work because they felt that they could get infected. So uh, that was another challenge. We had also the situation in China that people couldn't come to work because they were locked down. So not entire China was locked down, but uh, the Hubei province um, is home to many uh, migrant workers. So that was the challenge. Um, we also saw shortages of workers due to border restrictions uh, along the Belt and Road. Some projects uh, were delayed because the workers couldn't come back after the Chinese New Year holidays. In the factories, we see also constraints uh, uh, because we need the, as you mentioned, physical distancing. That means we can have not the same amount of people working at the same time. So we have to uh, work in, in more shifts or find other ways or uh, accept that we uh, operate at a lower productivity. And that is also the case. Uh, I would estimate that um, the uh, physical distancing uh, could cost 25% of productivity. But at the same time, I spoke about the uh, demand shock and uh, there are things uh, fall nicely into place that some don't mind to have a productivity shortcoming because they have also a, a, a revenue shortfall. But that uh, gives an idea about the overall uh situation of the workforce and, and what we went through and are still going through yeah so, so it's interesting so so overall it's the global supply chain has coped well um there's been challenges what if you if you maybe we, we look back a little bit uh, and we think about how it has been affected what, what are the what have been the major effects do you think on the global supply chain um is there anything that that they're now that they've learned and, and and it's really changing. I guess technology has been um, has been quite interesting as well. Um, yeah, what do you think that the effects have been? If we go to the um, markets, can be extremely volatile. We knew that before. We know about uh, Thanksgiving and we know about Christmas, uh, but uh, we haven't seen. Uh, something like the COVID-19 crisis before. So the volatility uh, is a learning which we have to factor into our, our practices uh, and also our tools, because some tools, uh, you spoke about digitization, uh, were not built to deal with such volatility. So they failed us. And uh, luckily we have experienced supply chain professionals that can fill in and uh, ensure uh, the supply of goods. So that's, that's one area. The other area of impact is the uncertainty or caused by the uncertainty. And this leads to the uh, uh, fact that we need to shorten our planning cycles because we don't have visibility over 13 weeks. 
Hence, we have to plan one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. <clears throat> and this is uh, another first impact and second uh, necessity which uh, comes out of the crisis. Then yeah. it became also clear that uh, those who had uh, shipment monitoring, asset tracking in place were better off than those that had not such tools. Uh, also, the uh, 24 seven monitoring of the supply chain ecosystem. That means the weather situation, the border closings, uh, the, the situation around critical infrastructure, uh, et cetera. Those who had the data and the analytics around it were better equipped. Then right. there is the whole uh, area uh, around remote operating. So yeah. remote operating for us first uh, triggers the idea of working from home, and that's true. And uh, it was amazing to see how many people can work from home. But also there is, uh, for example, remote inventory management that uh, some companies had set themselves up to do uh, the goods count without any human interference. And that, of course, helped here. And, and this drives my last point I want to mention, which is automation. Uh, the more automated uh, companies are better off. But I also would like to remind us that 300 million people work in factories and they work in factories right. because a lot of things cannot be uh, robotized. True. That's very true. We've we've heard a lot here, uh, and the government have been criticised a lot for the lack of PPE equipment, so the protective equipment. What have you seen from a, I guess, a global perspective? Was there was there really a shortage? Um, I guess we never predicted uh, this pandemic, so stuff wasn't made quick enough, or was it there and not not able to get to the right places? What, what what's kind of underlying all of this? There are multiple angles to this uh, topic. First, I think uh, that this uh, topic is highly emotional because it goes straight to our our fears and and our concerns. And it is also a political topic. Yeah. And this is independent from what the real situation is or is not. I think there is an exaggeration of the problem. Uh, clearly, we see a hype and we see uh, an enormous surge in needs for PPE. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that first, if we had more transparency and more collaboration across the globe, and if we had started in January, February, collapse collectively as a global community to deal with the situation and think about it and put the experts teams teams together, uh, the outcome would have been very different. Um, I also would like to uh, refer to a many, uh, let's say, suggestions in this field. The suggestion to have uh, buffer stocks, the suggestion to bring factories back home. Uh, yes. I think these are not the full solutions. And I can explain that. Uh, how many buffer stock do we want to have? And what, what goods do we want to stock? For which uh, problem disruption we are preparing? And this comes with high cost. I think it's part of the, part of the solution. So we yes. could think and we'll definitely review our, our emergency stock policies. But then when it comes to the relocation uh, discussion, do we really think that we want, or that it is feasible that countries from New Zealand to Nepal, from Malawi to Iceland, from Canada to, um, let's say, Uruguay, all have their own capacity of all essential goods, and then keep a lot of free capacity to deal with the peak situation, which is maybe a 10x demand compared to a normal situation. I, I think that also sounds not 
uh, as if it were a, a great solution. I believe it is about, as I said at the beginning, global coordination. It is about um, transparency in the uh, supply. So where are the factories? I think there we have also learning that we have not enough knowledge uh, about the global supply sources yes. and the true enabler to overcome what, what some think was a big challenge is more flexibility, is the flexibility to refurbish production lines. And we have seen that. We have seen in many places that factories that produce shoes uh, can also produce medical equipment, right? Yeah, and refashion then, them, absolutely. And then to deal with the surge in demand, this is about fast upscaling. So how can I upscale um, um, capacity within days? Yeah, there's some also some fabulous stories. I, I did a podcast with uh, a lady called Dr. Sophie Cox from the University of Birmingham, and her team uh, they gave 3D printers to all of the all of their all of the research team when they went home, and they designed and were 3D printing the the masks for the NHS, and they gave it to their local hospitals. A fantastic story of local local manufacturing, local supply. And often gets overlooked. You, you rarely hear those 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 great stories, and and certainly here in the UK, people really pull together. And I, I thought that was fantastic. Uh, you know, some really good things going on. What yeah, do you think I now? Can only, uh, I can only um, let's say underline this that uh, unfortunately we talk too much about the issues and the challenges we face, and yes. not enough about the the great things that happening. The, the creativity of the people, the initiative, and the solidarity which was brought uh, about by the whole situation. Definitely, definitely, because we hear a lot about people, you know, they're at home, uh, they're locked down, they don't want to get out. But when you walk around these cities, who are the people out working? You know, it's the delivery drivers, it's the healthcare workers, you know, these people really holding the countries together and you know, they're celebrated, but they should be celebrated more. And we should hear, I wish we'd hear more about these stories because you know, we, we know that, that negative news sells papers. So unfortunately, most of it's negative, but there's so many great stories around that we should be, we should be listening to. Yeah. And if we talk about people, we also need to think about all the train drivers, the pilots, uh, the, the delivery people, as you mentioned, or also about the 200,000 seafarers which cannot go home because we are missing a global standard for essential workforce. And we have 200,000 people sitting at home cannot go to work to replace them. So these wow. are the, the macro learnings um, we have to take in and work on. Yes, yes, absolutely. What do you, I'd be interested to talk about China and uh, certainly stories about the over-reliance on China for raw materials and finished products. What, what are you seeing? Are you seeing, are you seeing people wanting to try and, and reduce their reliance on China? H how are you seeing that develop? There is clearly a, a reliance on China. Uh, there is the um, uh, McKinsey Global Institute Institute, uh, China World Exposure Index. And this shows that the exposure that China has to the world peaked in 2007 and declined from, from there on. But that the, the exposure the world has um, in respect to China has uh, increased. The, the reason behind that is the very attractive value proposition of China, is the capability of China. I spoke about the rapid scaling up. If we look into where masks coming coming from today, a lot are coming from China because they ramped up uh, very quickly their capacity. Uh, 
the the reason why China became so heavy, such a heavy weight in the world economy is also the size of its market. We have to see that uh, China has probably 30% of the automotive market, uh, luxury, spirits, etc. So it is a market, it's not a factory. We speak very often uh, about China as the factory of the world, and that's true, but it is also the biggest market in many segments. So if sure. you want to serve that market, you need to be there. And then come the, the all the constraints around manufacturing, that you have um, a specialization. If we take computer notebooks, the, the core is the LCD. The LCD is uh, produced, uh, the screen is, is produced uh, in a very few factories in the world. So we okay. cannot just distribute it and, and some are in China. If we take the hard disk, hard disks are produced uh, by two manufacturers in the world and they have factories in uh, China, Malaysia and uh, Thailand. So it is very hard to decompose the, the, the supply chain, even if you want it. So we have a world where there are uh, a number of manufacturing hubs. One is China, there is, then there are smaller ones like Vietnam, um, Thailand, Malaysia, and Germany, of course, Japan, US, uh, Mexico. And these hubs have their competence. China is the center for mass production. Um, as I mentioned, Thailand is known for hard disk. We, we learned that the hard way during the, um, the Thailand flooding. Yes. And it, it will be very difficult to build up new and change also even the shape of these clusters. When I think about Germany, Germany has a very strong uh, capability in automotive. It has a very strong capability in machinery, but Germany lost its position in electronics uh, to the Japanese a long time ago. And it's very hard and, and Germany has never succeeded to, to grab some supply chains in, uh, in other areas. So that, that's the reality we are, we are seeing. So how is the way forward? I think that um, because of, I think the geopolitical landscape, there will be companies uh, building the additional capacity in right. other hubs than China. They will go to Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, uh, Mexico, as I mentioned. And, and this is not by chance that what all these areas are close to the biggest market, right? Yes. Uh, or part of the biggest market. There will be a bit into Turkey, which is also close to Europe, maybe uh, North Africa. Um, so it's the China plus approach. And yeah. this is also what uh, the, the companies or the associations say. Um, if, uh, if you look at uh, the developments in Japan, Japan offered companies that move out of China support, but uh, they made clear statements uh, leaving China, no thanks. <laughs> right. And what about, is, 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 is there a price issue as well here? China, China used to be used to be cheaper, uh, well, the cheapest, let's say, to, to manufacture. And has that changed now? That has changed a while ago. The rise, of, for example, of the electronics cluster in Vietnam came with Samsung. Samsung, Samsung about 10 years ago, a bit less than 10 years ago, uh, started moving production into Vietnam and out of China. And this because uh, labor costs were rising in China. And this is now almost 10 years back. So you can imagine that the situation is, uh, is uh, even more different today. And this yeah. is also in line with the uh, reforms uh, which are underway in China. Uh, China is moving up the value chain. And we have heard that a lot. 
And China has deliberately with its labor cost policy, that means by giving very high uh, wage increases to their workforce, with this, they have deliberately pushed out lower end manufacturing into Southeast Asia, into Cambodia, into, or into Bangladesh. Um, so it is a natural process. And that also will change uh, the, the way China is positioned in the world. And it also indicates what the real reason for the US-China rivalry is, because the battlefield has moved up the value chain. It's not a trade battle, it's a technology battle. And it's a battle in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. Because I guess when we talk supply chains, we're not just talking physical goods anymore. Um, if I want to buy my, uh, Microsoft Office, it's, it's a digital product. Are, are you seeing now, you know, there's more and more digitalization, more and more people are buying stuff online, digital stuff. Have you, have you seen that accelerate? That's exactly what I meant uh, when I said the battle is kind of moving into the cloud. Right, okay. We see, we see uh, a few trends in globalization over the last 10, 15 years. And one trend is that the uh, goods value chains get less labor intense, meaning although production is moving out and the output is moving up, um, not moving out, moving up, uh, we see less of the goods crossing the border. Then we see also that supply chains are more regionally concentrated. So it's the Asian supply chain, it's the European supply chain, it's the North American supply chain. And by the way, it's not a chain, chain it's a network. And right. it becomes clear when I talk about the platforms because you have one tier, uh, one, uh, tier N supplier um, who gets supplied or materials from several sources, he supplies then other suppliers, they supply to other factories, everything is connected, um, it is variable to a certain extent. So we are talking about networks. But right. the, another, another trend, so the first trend, as I said, is less trade intensive. The second trend is more regional concentrated. The third is what I spoke about before, that only less today, less than 20% uh, of the supply chains are driven by labor cost arbitrage. So the whole labor argument, which we hear in the press uh, all the time, is in fact, not there anymore or to a much uh, lesser extent. But the fourth trend uh, I wanted to come to is that uh, the trade of services is growing 60% faster than the trade of goods. And in some sectors, it can be 100%, 100%, 100%, 300% faster. And national statistics attribute 23% of trade to services trade. And right. if we add to this, the free services, uh, the services we use now every day, Zoom, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, et cetera, uh, Instagram, we reach uh, a number slightly above 50%, which means that the new phase of globalization is in fact digitization. And when we look at China and the US and compare this, the US is far ahead of China in services trade, but yeah. China is catching up. And that's one of the, the areas where uh, the competition takes place now. Very interesting. We've, I guess yeah, my, my, my last question, which is interesting to discuss, and we've touched on probably a lot of the aspects of the answer anyway, but how, how do you think global supply chains will look like post COVID once all said and done? Uh, have, have you found that the trends we've discussed have accelerated quicker because of COVID? What do you, what do you think we're gonna see? 
I'm saying regularly now that um, what I have seen in the last five months, I expect it to see in the next five years. And this in terms of adaptation in the in respect to digital products and services. It's absolutely right what you are saying, Lewis. We see an acceleration of the pre-COVID-19 trends. We see probably a bit more faster regionalization of supply chains, although there will always be uh, intercontinental traffic as long as people love certain products and as long as uh, not each country has all the resources it needs. Uh, yeah. We will see uh, probably uh, a major, a major boost of uh, digital services. And in the supply chain, we will see more monitoring, more remote uh, management of inventories, more uh, remote lane uh, or quick lane validation. So the whole whole management of supply chain will be uh, done in a digital way. Um, I, I, the, the days are long gone where, where the physical good is the center of the supply chain. It's now the data, the information. Uh, it's still a relationship-based uh, business, but we will see uh, much more um, uh, digital tools uh, applied. I hope that we will see a bit more coordination and a bit more help from the global political institutional community. Uh, I mentioned uh, the tragedy around the seafarers. They are uh, in fact imprisoned in their uh, in their current contract and, and cannot get out and, uh, and should go home. Uh, we also need to rethink uh, our approach to critical infrastructure. I think every country over the last 10, 20 years has identified critical infrastructure, but we need to uh, find out and, and define how do we deal with critical infrastructure in the situation of a major pandemic. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Wolfgang. I, I really appreciate you sharing your, your thoughts with us. Uh, very interesting times ahead. A lot of interesting times have just, just passed and it's crazy to think that there's still six months left of 2020 as well. And so who knows what's going to happen next. But yeah, thank you very much for joining me and uh, look forward to speaking to you uh, again. Louis, thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure and it's such an important topic and we have to remain on our toes because as as you're saying we don't know what uh, what the future holds very true thank you so much uh, i'll speak to you soon